Welcome to Christ Chapel College, the college outreach of Christ Chapel Bible Church in Fort Worth, Texas. We hope everyone experiences what Jesus calls abundant life. So we unapologetically point to Him as the source of life and joy. If you're a college student in the Fort Worth area, we'd be stoked to connect with you. Find out more at ChristChapelCollege.org and on Instagram at Christ Chapel College. Glad you're here, man. It is um, a, a serious joy to get to worship with you, much less get to preach God's word this morning. My name is Ben. I'm one of the pastors around here, and I get to um, I get to wrap up our series today in First Samuel. So if you've if you've been with us, we've been in the book of First Samuel. That's where we're going to be today, and we're going to start in chapter 31 of First Samuel, which is the last chapter in the book. We've been uh, walking our way through this book for the last 15 weeks. Uh, it's been awesome. We are about halfway, really, through the story that uh, really was on our staff's heart uh, to walk you guys through, which is great because where we're going to pick up next Sunday is the beginning of Second Samuel. Um, and, and really what we're going to see is the story continue and, and really complete in, in what we see in the life of David uh, juxtaposed to uh, Saul, which we're going to talk about today. And so um, join us next week for sure. It's, it's going to be our last Sunday in here before uh, the Christmas break, but my boy Ryan McCarthy is going to start 2 Samuel. But I get to finish um, 1 Samuel. Chapter 31 is heavy. We're going to read it, so start flipping there. And if you don't have a Bible, by the way, um, we'll throw most of the verses up on the screen. But also, we've got Bibles around here. We'd love to just give you one. So on your way out, or if you want to right now, grab one, and you take that and keep it. Um, while you're flipping there, just to kind of set up what we're doing, um, there's this term, sow and reap, right, which I'm sure you're familiar with. A lot of times it's talked about in kind of a spiritual religious sense. But this idea of, of this agricultural idea for me and my family, for example, we are awful at keeping plants alive. We bought our first house, um, and when we bought our first house, we bought it from um, a couple that was like really, they had like a garden, and there was a grapevine that grew on this fence, and there was like this incredible garden with like asparagus and flowers and green and purpley things and all kinds of stuff. I don't know what it was. And my wife and I are, we just are bad at that. Like we, things die a lot um, around our yard and, and in potted plants or anywhere. It doesn't matter, which is ironic because uh, Amy, who's on our staff, our director of shepherding, Amy's really good at that. And she's on our staff. And I feel like every time I use the illustration, she cringes because like for her, that's life giving. Um, well, it's this idea that you plant a seed and, and what you plant, you're going to reap, right? In, in theory. And so even for us, in, you know, in our little garden, in the first house we bought, uh, we didn't really tend to it, we didn't really do anything, but it still would grow things, and then those things would germinate, and they would turn into other things, and so, for example, for like three years, we had asparagus growing in our backyard, and we did nothing, just because it would grow, and it would, you know, and it would die, and then all of a sudden, the next season, it would grow again, and those seeds kind of continued uh, to spread. Well, also, um, you sow and reap negative things as well, and so obviously, in the agricultural sense, you know, weeds, right? You seeds and weeds and, and all of a sudden those come and then those spread and those become more and more. What we're going to see and what we're going to talk about is really this concept in our life of, of what we sow and what we reap, the negative and the positive of it. So I'm going to jump into chapter 31 uh, of 1 Samuel and we're going to be in just the first uh, seven verses um, and uh, just a, a forewarning. It is heavy, dark stuff. So we are coming in hot. Get ready. Verse 1 of chapter 31. Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines overtook Saul and his sons, and the Philistines struck down Jonathan and Abimadad and Malchishua, the sons of Saul. The battle pressed hard against Saul, and the archers found him, and he was badly wounded by the archers. Then Saul said to his armor bearer, Draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and mistreat me. But his armor bearer would not, for he feared greatly. Therefore Saul took his own sword and fell upon it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell upon his sword and died with him. Thus Saul died, and his three sons, and his armor-bearer, and all his men on the same day together. 
And when the men of Israel who were on the other side of the valley and those beyond the Jordan saw that the men of Israel had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they abandoned their cities and fled. And the Philistines came and lived in them. Welcome to Christ Chapel College, guys. That's how we do it. Um, This is a really heavy and just dark passage, right? But I want to start, as we wrap up this book, um, I want to start with really this heavy moment. Um, This is the end of King Saul's life. King Saul was this guy who had all the promise, right? He he had all the potential in the world. He was beloved and adored. He he started his reign with these huge military victories. And, And all of a sudden, we get to this place at the end of the book, in chapter 31, where we see Saul broken, uh, embarrassingly led his men out of his own pride into a fight they shouldn't have been in, defeated, I mean, asking for someone else be- to, to kill him because he didn't want that dishonor, and arguing and begging his, his servant to do that job. And I, I, when I read this, and when I first started studying this, even this summer, I couldn't help but to think of just what's going through his head. Right, if you're King Saul, you've got arrows in you, you're wounded past repair, you know it's over, and and you're laying in a ditch on Mount Gilboa, and what's gotta be going through your head is, how did I get here? Right, like how did this happen? How is this the end of Saul? I mean, he was the first king of Israel, anointed by God, all the promise, favor of God, victories and praise and beloved by people and wealth and success, gifted, and now he's laying in a ditch with arrows in him, trying to figure out how to end his life before he gets tortured. He's got to be thinking, how did I get here? What I want to do is I want to answer that question. I want us to look biblically back through 1 Samuel um, and really answer that question of how. How did he get so broken and so stuck in this ditch? And so I want to preview where I'm I'm going for the sermon for the next 25 minutes is I want to answer that question of how by really quickly walking through really a review of 1 Samuel that has to do with four or five key moments in Saul's life that I think let us in to a thread that runs the entire book that really is a, a timeless truth. And so I want us to answer the question, but also I want us to look at something that I think God God's word is saying is true for us and is a caution for us and is an encouragement for us to how to live a life so that when we look up in our 40s or our 50s or our 70s or our mid-20s that we don't have these moments where we say, how? How did this happen? How did we get so far off? How did we get so stuck? How did we get so broken? How did we get so empty? I genuinely hope and pray those aren't moments you're in now, but I, I think I think as a part of humanity, there's going to be seasons where we struggle with those questions, and, and I think God's word leads us to be able to look back at our life, and instead of saying, how did it get so bad, we say, God, how did, how did we get here? How did we get such grace? How did we get such contentment? How did we get such joy? Um, and so that's what I want to do. I want us to walk back through that and then unpack what that means. And then unapologetically, we're going to talk about the gospel um, because we always do that. Um, and it's going to be key to understanding ha- how to walk this out. And then the band's going to come up here. They're going to play a song on our hope and our prayers that we leave here changed. So that's what we're doing. Um, here we go. Uh, let me unpack kind of these four or five moments. Before I do that, I'm just going to walk through. We're going to see these seeds, right? Right, that kind of got sown into Saul's life and his heart and his head and his thought processes. And then we're going to see how they reap and how they kind of progress. And there's kind of this chain reaction domino effect. But before that, I got to set it up, right? Because chapters 1 through 7 in 1 Samuel is all about Israel and a guy named Samuel. And Samuel is the prophet of God. He speaks on behalf of, of God to the people of Israel. They don't have a king. Chapter 8 changes everything. Chapter 8, now the people of Israel say, we want a king. We don't want just God and and our prophet or our judge to speak. We want an actual king. Everybody else gets one. And so then in chapter 9, what we saw is that God says, okay, I'm going to give them what they want. They don't want me. They want an earthly king. Great. But then God points out Saul. So he tells Samuel, his prophet, that's the guy. So then in chapter 10, we see the anointing of uh, Saul by Samuel. So look at 
chapter 10, verse 1, we're going to see just even in that first verse, we're going to see this, this go down. This Samuel and Saul kind of get this one-on-one, and, and Samuel's like, man, I heard from God. You're the guy. Verse 1, then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, has not the Lord anointed you to be prince over his people Israel? And you shall reign over the people of the Lord and you will save them from the hand of their surrounding enemies and this shall be the sign to you that the Lord has anointed you to be prince over his heritage. Okay, so let's stop right there. So what's happening is is this is the moment, right? This is the moment where Samuel is saying, you're going to be the guy. Oil, it's kind of this, he's kind of being knighted in this way. And then he's going to say, here's the sign that's going to confirm that. And then I'm going to paraphrase, but what's going to happen between verse 2 and verse 17 is Samuel says, all this crazy stuff's about to happen that's going to confirm it. Saul, you're going to run into this. Somebody's going to ask you about these donkeys. You're going to answer this way. There's going to be this miracle thing. You're going to talk to these people. They're not going to see you. There's all this stuff, and that's exactly what happens. All this confirmation happens on Saul's life in the next really 24 hours after this to where it's like, okay, it's clear he is the guy. So now it's time to introduce him to the people. And this is huge, right? This is, I mean, these people have never had a king. Right? So this isn't just like a presidential inauguration that we sleep through. This is like the first uh, anointing of the king. They know Samuel's job is to go find him. Where is he, Samuel? Who's the guy, Samuel? And now it's finally time to introduce him. Pick up with me at verse 17 uh, through 21 as Saul is about to introduce, uh, as Samuel, excuse me, is about to introduce Saul. Verse 17. Now Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mitzvah. And he said to the people of Israel, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of the kingdoms that were oppressing you. But today you've rejected your God who saves you from all calamities and your distresses and you have said to him, set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord and your tribes and by your thousands. So he's gathering all these tribes. Then Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel near and the tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot and he brought the tribe of Benjamin near by its clans and the clan, and the clan of the Matarites was taken by Lot and Saul the son of Kish. So that's, that Saul was taken by Lot. But when they sought him, he could not be found. So stop right there. So here's what's happening. This huge, important ceremony, and hey, guys, you wanted a king. God's given you a king. God's gracious. Even though that's not the best option, God being king would have been the best option, but okay, he's gonna gonna allow this. It's gonna, and he he announces, it's gonna be Saul, and so he's, he's ready to do that, but then you saw what happens in verse 21. He's nowhere to be found. I want you to see and observe this seed that's happening. Something's happening in, in Saul's head, in his heart. When they sought him, he could not be found. Then look at verse 22. So they inquired again of the Lord, uh, is there a man still to come? And the Lord said, behold, he has hidden himself among the baggage. Then they ran and took him from there, and when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. And Samuel said to all the people, do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? There is none like him among all the people, and all the people shouted, long live the king. Really cool, important moment in the history of Israel, but it'd be really easy to miss this weird little nuance in verse 24, I mean in verse 21 and 22. They're ready to announce him. He's the guy. They all are praising him. I mean, he's going to look the part, and yet he can't be found because he's hiding in the baggage. There's something happened. There's a seed here I want us to understand as we progress through Saul's life, and the, the word of God gives us this thread, that, that Saul has these thoughts that we see behind the curtain of, of, of massive insecurity. And even from the beginning, there's this insecurity in Saul who, who just went through an entire chapter of already being anointed and all these miraculous confirmations that he was the guy, and yet when it's time to say, ladies and gentlemen, Saul, it's silent because he's hiding, and they have to go find him. They say, hey, you're the guy, and then he's the guy, and he looks the part, and wow, he's amazing, and everyone's cheering for him. But we see right off the bat this insecurity, and here's the thing. He never, he never talks about it. Saul never brings it up. There's this thought of his, of his own insecurity, but it's never addressed. He never humbles himself. He never says, I'm not sure if I'm worthy. He, he, he just sits on it, and we, and we see that thought, and we see that thought 
progress and sow, and we see that become action, right? Saul, we see right off the bat, has these insecurities, which everybody has, but then we see this progression, this domino, this reaping of those thoughts becoming action. Look a couple chapters later, and this is actually two years later, um, but we're going to skip to chapter 13. I want you to see kind of the, the second little movement here that happens. 13 verses 5 through 11. This is two years later. Saul's been the king. He's gotten all these great victories. All this cool stuff has happened. But then look at, look at, uh, look at this mistake he makes. And the Philistines mustered to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and troops like the sand of the seashore in multitude. They came up and encamped at Mishmash and east of of Beth-Avon. When the men of Israel saw that they were in trouble, for the people were hard-pressed, the people hid themselves in caves and in holes and in rocks and in tombs and in cisterns. And some Hebrews crossed the fords into the Jordan, into the land of Gad and, Gil- and, and Gilead. Saul was still in Gilgal, and all the people following him trembled. So the enemy is coming. Everybody, all the Jews, Israelites are panicked and hiding and running to other places. Here's Saul. He's in this place. He's, he's, he's got to get ready for this battle. He's been told that this is coming. He's been told that Saul's going to come and, and do this offering to prepare for, for battle. And verse 8, he waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal. And the people were scattering from him. And then verse 9 is really important, this action, this thing that happens that, that Saul chooses to do. So Saul said, Bring the burnt offering here to me and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offerings. As soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him and greet him. Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, well, when I saw that the people were scattering from me and that you did not come within the days appointed that the Philistines had mustered all from Mishnash. So, So here's what happened. This insecurity, this, this insecurity that we've seen in Saul f- from the beginning that goes unresolved, it starts to become action, right? That insecurity starts to become action and disobedient actions and there's consequences, right? There's consequences to what he's doing. And so instead of waiting for Samuel, the priest, to come and do this religious ceremony and to come and do this offering, that was Samuel's job, Saul starts seeing the people scatter. He just thinks logically, oh, you know what? I know, I know I'm the king. I'm not supposed to do this. This is a role for the prophet Samuel. This is not a role that God has given me. This is not in bounds for Saul. But Saul's thinking, man, I'm scared. I'm worried. It's not happening the way I wanted to. I need to take control. I need to take control. I need to take action. And I need to do this. I need to do this ceremony. I need to, to do this burnt offering to, to bless our, our troops and to provide us victory and to do this thing to rally our people. And so we see this action that he does that ends up uh, costing him huge. Look at, uh, look at the consequences that we see, verse 12 through 14 there in chapter uh, 13. I said, now the Philistines will come down. This is him trying to explain his way out of this really just disobedient action. Now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I'll have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and the Lord had commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Huge turning point in the story and history of Saul, right? This insecurity, these thoughts that he had that he he, he left unresolved then started to become some disobedient action, right? That's this second seed. But then look at this action is gonna start to become a habit, Right, it starts small, but it really becomes a habit. Look with me real quickly to, to chapter 15. Right, chapter 15, we see this start to become a, a habit of his control, his, his fear. Um, 15, verses two and three, thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all they have. Do not spare them. 
but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. God is serious about sin, and he's serious about removing sin from the land, right? God knows there are these people that are horrible people, and they've done horrible things and are doing horrible horrible abominations against the Lord and against neighboring people and against the Jewish people. And so God says, hey, I want you to be a picture of my sanctification and my purification of what I'm trying to do in this land. And so God, again, gives him a command. And I'll just paraphrase where where we go. We, We see the pattern of where this is headed, right? In chapter 15, what does he do, right? He's already kind of disobeyed because it wasn't convenient. He did his own offering. Well, chapter 15, he he goes and they invade and they, they, they kind of take, take over this really evil place. But he leaves the king alive and he kills all the worthless animals, but all the best animals he keeps. And so he starts to just pick and choose how he wants to do this. It, it becomes a habit in his life that he gets to decide how he wants to function and how he wants to live and, and how he wants to do it his way. And so we see these dominoes in Saul's life fall uh, in chapter 18. I'll just paraphrase it the fourth movement that we see is um, by chapter 18 Saul is so jealous when David shows up on the scene he's so jealous that while David's playing the musical instrument the lyre in the 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 palace Saul on a couple of different occasions tries to spear him it says in chapter 18 pin him to the wall because he's so jealous of David and and if you read chapter 18 you think Saul is crazy I mean, he's just gone crazy with rage. And, and at first he's like, cool. He's like, hey, come and play your musical instrument. And he plays and he snaps and he wigs out and he tries to throw spears at him. He's like, no, no, we're cool. And he's just gone off the rails. But here's what I want you to hear, guys. And this is really important. It, that doesn't happen overnight, right? It'd be really easy to look at that. It'd be really easy to look at people in your life and say, man, this guy, this girl is off the rails, the, the way this person lives, the way this person acts, this person's lifestyle is crazy. It's off the rails. And it'd be so easy to look at them and do that, right? We saw that Saul's actions become these habits of wanting to do it his way. It starts small, but, but then it continues, right? And Saul's habit of control, which started as just insecurity, remember? Just started as these, these unconfessed, unresolved thoughts, fears left unchecked they become Saul's character of just jealousy and cruelty it becomes who he is right by chapter 18 Saul is a pretty horrible person chapter 19 Saul tries to kill David chapter 22 Saul goes and kills a priest in a totally different land for helping out David Chapter 24, again, Saul tries to rid the kingdom of David because he wants it his way. Chapter 28, Saul goes to a medium, like a a witch, so that he can talk to ghosts. I mean, he goes off the rails, leading all the way to chapter 31. And King Saul, who had all this promise, is laying in a ditch, begging his servant to kill him. And he's got to think, how did I get here? How did I get here? He reaped and he sowed and he reaped and he sowed. And we see this thread throughout God's word, this pattern that happens. A life of sowing and reaping and eventually very gradually led him to that ditch. And here's this timeless truth in in God's word, right? Here's this observation that's true for you and it's true for me as we study this, right? There's this path, right? We, We sow a thought, we have a thought, and that thought reaps an, an attitude, right? We, we, we sow a thought, and that reaps an attitude, and that can look all kinds of unhealthy ways, right? It could be bitterness. We, we could really be bitter and jeal- have a hard time forgiving somebody. We didn't, I mean, they don't deserve our forgiveness, and so we're just not going to forgive them, or, or that, that's a really complicated thing at, at times, depending on how badly somebody hurts us. And so we, we have these thoughts about people, and we just let them stay there, these unhealthy things. Maybe it's, we have sexual thoughts, right? We have thoughts that, and, and make no mistake, God invented sex, man. It drives me crazy whenever churches and ministries just throw that. I mean, God invented it. It's a good and great thing. But when we take it out of bounds of how God designed it to work between a husband and wife, and so, and so maybe in our lives, certainly in my life I've struggled with, you have a thought, and you let those thoughts become dormant, and you let those thoughts stay in your head, and you start to see 
a romantic partner or you start to see the opposite sex in a way that then all of a sudden becomes an attitude. It's not just a thought, it becomes an attitude of how you see them, right? And maybe it's not even, maybe it's not even those things on, on the list uh, that, we, that we know we should flee from. Maybe it's even things like self-righteousness, right? Maybe it's even a thought of, man, I've gotta earn this. I gotta be moral enough, I gotta be good enough, I gotta go to church enough. And so all of a sudden we start believing a a thought, a lie, ultimately, that says, well, you're not good enough unless you can earn it, unless you clean yourself up. That's how you're going to be able to present yourself before God, is you've got to clean. And so then that thought starts to become an attitude that starts to shape. And then that attitude, we sow that, and that starts to reap action. Right? It goes from thoughts to all of a sudden we start acting on some of those. I mean, we've all done that. We start to make little chips away at, at whatever those actions are, whatever those steps are, maybe these, these places that we, I mean, we start to step out of bounds, and that becomes more and more comfortable for us. And certainly for Saul, it became more and more comfortable to just do it his way, to just only think through this new lens, this new attitude, these new actions, and so then we sow those actions, and then we reap habits, Right, and we're sowing in actions and we're reaping habits and now they're just habitual in our life and we don't even know why we're doing them anymore. And all of a sudden, we find ourselves going through life with these habits that we don't like that we do anymore. We're not proud of them. We, we they aren't necessarily fruitful in our life or enjoyable and, we start to, and we start to find ourselves a little bit in those ditches and we start to maybe be discouraged or we start to be just worn out by, by these habits in our life that don't actually produce joy or life, and and then we sow those habits, and then we reap a lifestyle, right? It starts to shape our character, and this is a thread we see throughout Scripture. This is a thread we explicitly see in 1 Samuel. It's easy to look at chapter 31 and just miss, wow, Saul's crazy. Saul's crazy, and I guess he's a bad guy. Man, nobody starts that way. He just started walking down that path, and thoughts became became attitudes, it became actions, it became habits, it became lifestyles and characters, then we, we sow those lifestyles. We sow that character of who we are and it becomes a destiny, right? We reap a destiny. It, a destiny towards, really, if it's these negative things, if it's these toxic things, it becomes this, this pathway towards just death, right? And I don't necessarily mean always physical death, but just kind of an emptiness and a brokenness and a loneliness and all of these things that we look up and we're like, man, this is not what I want. And ultimately, an, an eternity and a future are shaped by these things. We are called to be righteous as Christ is righteous. Now, I, I'm going to talk for a, in a second about where our destiny is secured and how it's secured and where we have our assurance of our destiny if we're in Christ. But man, it, it matters, right? It matters, and, and our choices that we make all along the way matter. I saw on Instagram actually this last week, and I just, I, I, my brain exploded a little bit, and it was somebody that had posted something that said something to the extent of, um, something to the extent of, man, I, I take so much comfort in the fact that I, I know God wouldn't let me ruin my life. And so kind of the idea was I don't exactly know his phrase, but it's the idea that like, hey, I'm going to do whatever, but I don't really know if I'm making the right decision. I just know God wouldn't let me ruin my life. And that's a really dangerous mentality. It's amazing how popular that mentality is, right? Well, I'm just going to live however I want to live. And, and then we just say, well, there's just going to be this cheap grace that covers it. And God's going to make it all, all work out for our good, and I think that's really scary. And I think if we take that mentality, sure, that'd be, that'd be really sweet if, if God's primary goal was to make sure we live really comfortable lives. But then we read Scripture and we think, wait, God's called us to a life and a life abundant, but because we're rooted in bringing him glory. I mean, we live, um, you guys live in a world, as, as college students and young adults, you live in a world where people are constantly lying and planting the thought in your head, this is college. Live it up, right? Sow your wild oats is literally a phrase people say to college students. Now is the season for you to sow your wild oats, which means you will reap those things. And make being in ministry for a while and walking with young adults and college students and young married couples, man, and I watch those patterns that are established in their life that doesn't turn out good. And yet you live in a whole world that says, get it out of your system. 
Go and chase, go and, go and do whatever you want to do. Live for yourself, live your way. And man, you've got a world around you that is selling you something that is going to keep you hungry and keep you going back and keep you buying what the world is selling and keep you massively empty. And you're going to keep going back to these empty wells to fill you up. And it is, and it is prone to all of us to fall into those traps. And so here we have a culture that says, yeah, do whatever you want, do whatever you want. And, and, and my hope and my prayer is that we see God's word and, and the Holy Spirit and the gospel convicts us to say, wait, I don't want to do that. I want to live for him. I want to surrender. I want to be free from that. I want to break those chains. And maybe today you feel like you're stuck I don't know how far down you feel like you are in some of those habits or lifestyles or thoughts or attitudes that you feel like you can't shake and you're not proud of, but there is another way, right? There is another way, and let me tell you what that way is not. That way is not just cleaning yourself up by moralism, right? That way is not cleaning yourself up by coming to church a lot and making sure you don't say the F word and making sure you don't see rated R movies unless it's about Jesus, right? That's not how we do that, right? It's, it's not about your moralism, how we break that chain is because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And a lot of us have heard the gospel. And then we take the gospel and we turn it into cheap grace. The gospel, the gospel does not exist to be a pass to get you out of living a bunch of disobedience. The gospel is the power of God for you to be set free from your disobedience not as a pass to say, well, I'm going to use the Jesus card and I'm going to live however I want and I'm going to plant whatever seeds I want in this season of my life and live for myself. But I got that Jesus card as kind of my, my pass to wipe that out. And, and that's a misunderstanding of what the gospel is. It's actually the power to set you free so that you can actually obey him. Because in obeying God, in obeying God is actually freedom and life and joy and the spirit of God meeting us in that place. And so then all of a sudden, we, we have our hearts shaped. I, I want to um, read Romans 6, a, a little section of Romans 6 to you that I think Paul um, really beautifully articulates just that idea. Um, but in Romans 6, Paul looks at the gospel, right, which is the fact that you can't clean yourself up. I am not good enough. I'm not moral enough. I'm not churchy enough to clean myself up that I need a Savior to clean me up. And so the gospel is the only hope I've got that 2,000 years ago, not a prophet, not a great guy, but God entered into our world in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And he lived the life that I was actually called to. He planted only fruitful seeds. He was only obedient and righteous as he was, as he was God in flesh. And then he hung on a cross and he died for my sins and for all of those who surrender their lives and say, no longer for myself. No longer will I be king. No longer will I live for myself in this season and, and do me. I will be about you. You are my king. You are my hope. And that surrender, that act of faith into Jesus and Jesus alone then sets me free. And it doesn't just set me free to do whatever I want. It sets me free as being what Paul's going to talk about as a slave to sin, emptiness, winding me up in a ditch somewhere, it, it sets me free from that to being a slave to righteousness because there's only two options. Look at what, look what Paul says in Romans 6. I'm gonna start in 17. I'm not gonna put it up there, but um, if you wanna read along, or if you're note takers, man, spend some time in Romans 6, 17 through 23. That's what I'm gonna read over you is we're about to wrap up our time. Listen to Paul articulate this beautiful progression of dominoes towards righteousness. He says, but thanks be to God that you were once slaves of sin. Slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. And then Paul says, I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness. You see the dominoes that are all throughout Scripture. Lawlessness leading to more sin, reaping and sowing more and more. So now present your members as slaves to righteousness leading to sanctification, maturity, that purification. And in verse 20, he says this, 
For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regards to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. If you're here, and and like all of us, or so many of us in our story, we've wandered into those things that we thought, man, this is, and not just we thought, man, it felt fun for moments, and it, it felt like that thing that the world offered, and it felt like this immediately gratifying thing, and, and even Paul nails us, if this is you, to say this is ultimately empty, and if you're here, and if the Holy Spirit is poking on your heart, it's not an accident. Don't take it as preaching or worship or church. Take it as the Spirit of God saying, hey, those, those things that you keep chasing down, weekend after weekend or relationship after relationship or or internship to achieve or to succeed all of those things you know how empty they keep leaving you and if you're honest if you slow down for a second you hear God's word in verse 20 of chapter 6 and you think yes they're empty you were slaves of sin but free in regard to righteousness but but what fruit they're ashamed for the end of those things is death and then he says in verse 22 and 23 But now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Man, because of the gospel, because of Jesus, there is a different way. Right, we are set free. And so I don't, you might feel like you're stuck in that chain of, of thoughts and habits and you feel stuck and you feel low and you, you, you're in a place right now where you're like, man, I don't want this anymore. I, I want you to hear the encouragement and the power that's in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That you don't have to leave here with your head hanging low. You can say, okay, today, God, would you set me free from that? Would you reset the chain? Would you bring me from death to life? Because these things are so empty. And so today, you get to hear God's word give you a path, a savior, a person, a person who is our hope and the power to be able to set us free, make us new, all of the shame that you feel stuck in, all of those things and those patterns and those habits and that stuff that you've done or that's happened to you or those thoughts. You have a God who's more powerful than all of those who says, come, let me set you free. Walk with me. Be a, no longer a slave to sin, be a slave to righteousness. Fully submit to me and it will produce life and life abundantly. That's available for all of us today. And as we go back into worship, my hope and my encouragement to you guys is that you would meditate on that. The band's gonna come up and they're gonna play and you can sing a song, but I wanna encourage you, man, to, to worship, to engage with God today. I don't know what your story is. I don't know what you're struggling with. I don't know where you're at, but I know there is hope. And I so badly, our staff, our, our church, we pray for you guys a ton. We want you to look up and not in your 40s with a, a marriage that you feel like, how did this get so bad or or in your 50s with a career, you say, what have I been chasing after? In your 60s or in your mid-20s or in your 80s, or your, that you look back and say, God, look at what you've done as I've drawn near to you. Look what you've produced in my life. You've given me new thoughts. You've given me a new attitude. You've given me new action to follow you and new habits and a new character. It doesn't point to me and how good I am, but it points to you. That's our hope, that's our prayer, and that's the power of the gospel. Let me pray for us. Father, we love you and we need you. God, I just pray for my brothers and sisters in this room. Um, Lord, I pray that uh, you would do what only you could do, God. That your Holy Spirit would uh, move in their hearts and my heart too, God. I need you. We, are, we boast in our desperation uh, for you. And so, Lord, would you move in all of our hearts, um, to find us in this so often broken chain that leads us away from you and find us in those places and and give us the faith to surrender and return to you a gracious God, a Father who, um, because of Jesus and only through Jesus, you don't see our sin as a disqualifier. You see it as something that's paid for, fully paid for. Would we walk in that freedom? Would we have the, the thoughts that you've given us? Would we have the habits that you have designed for us to remind us and keep us in your grace? Would you um, draw us near to you? 
to my friends who are in this room, God, who um, as they hear this message, as they sing this song, Lord, maybe they know that they have never fully experienced the grace of God. They've maybe tried church or they've tried being good for a season or being more moral. Uh, They've maybe acknowledged Jesus, but God, they've never become a slave to righteousness. They've never experienced the Holy Spirit setting them free and giving them a new heart and a new mind and renewing their life, God, would you draw them near to you and save them, God, that they would have the boldness today, this morning, December 3rd, say, Jesus, I need you. I surrender to you. I put my faith in you. What you did 2,000 years ago is my only hope today for righteousness. Come, take over. Would you do that work in our hearts Leave us changed for your glory in the name of Jesus. Amen.